Hi, I'm Penny Jude. I'm the Star Trek archivist here at Paramount Pictures. We want to show you something special for the Star Trek VI DVD. Come on in. Hi there, sorry about all the locks. This is one of the most highly secured rooms on the Paramount lot. And as you'll see, it's because we have props in here that have been used on films all the way back to Star Trek I. Actually, I call it my great big toy box. So let me give you a tour of what we've got in here. This is Leonard Nimoy's costume, AKA Spock, from obviously from Star Trek VI. Most of the Starfleet members wore the same uniform. Let me put my keys down. I have keys to just about all the warehouses. Matter of fact, that's one of my nicknames is the keeper of the keys. Lock. <laughs> Let me start off with some of the other props that still remain from Star Trek VI. If you remember in the opening scene, you see the cup start to shake and rattle. It really broke my heart, I have to tell you, when I saw the cup crash to the floor because it's real bone china that Falsecraft was kind enough to send us. This is a Klingon mask from Star Trek VI. Most of the time, the hero Klingons are done with appliances so that there's multiple pieces applied to a face. But because these guys were gonna just be background, they went ahead and made a full mask and then just set it over the shoulders and then they would just put makeup on the eyes and the mouth, possibly, and maybe a few hair appliances in some places. Of course, we have a canteen. See a little bit of Klingon writing there. This would have been at Royal Pensee Mine. This is vacuum molded, sorry about the scotch tape, but inside a battery so that this would have come alive whenever they would have slid the computer chip in here, the computer reader. This is an example of kit bashing where they would have taken model kits, like say a battle cruiser for example, the USS New Jersey, submarines, things like that. And so you don't have to buy 20 USS New Jerseys, they would have made a master and then they would have vacuum molded that and created these time after time after time. Back here's a Myers mask. I think this is a really cool prop because it just fits the whole scene of the Klingons and being on this ice planet in Repenthe and the miners having to protect their eyes. This would have been, obviously these aren't lights, but they're supposed to look like lights. And that's another thing on the film industry. It only has to look like it works. It doesn't really have to work most of the time. This is probably one of my favorite weapons in storage here in the archive. This is the assassin's hand weapon. Several of these were actually what we call hero props, where this would slide back and there were batteries in here, and then this would have been lit so that they can then, in visual effects, give it the beaming effect. Another prop from Star Trek VI are the Klingon books that Uhura searched through in order to find Klingon languages. Remember they were trying to sneak past the Klingons so they could rescue our heroes? Inside, they actually inserted Klingon language pages. And on the front, of course, is embossed Klingon language. The Klingon gavel from the Klingon courtroom, Star Trek VI. Your hand goes in there. The thing probably weighs about 10 pounds. It's made out of molded fiberglass. Kapwa! This is a Klingon disruptor, which you'll see time after time in most of the Star Trek features, along with the TNG television series, for example, or any place we basically have seen a Klingon since the original series. There's also a hand version, which basically would be just like this, only it starts from here and goes forward. When I first found this in a paper sack, I thought it was a rifle, so I had to do a little research to confirm what it actually was. It's a mining tool from the Ruapenthe mines. You know how they always save the president's pens and pencils and every time he signs another treaty? That's basically what this is. This is the Kittimer Peace Treaty Pen. The United Federation of Planets welcomes you to Camp Kittimer. Here we have an Uhura earpiece. What I'm surprised mostly at is that they didn't change too much from the original series, but of course this fits into her ear. And I don't know how they ever got the thing to sit there in the first place, but I just thought this was such an interesting thing that, that there's poor Nichelle sitting there trying to keep this thing sticking in her ear the whole feature. Paramount set dressers and prop makers tend to use materials over and over again. If you pay really close attention, you can see tiny little buttons in here. This was actually used in the remake of the blob in a miniature set. This was an ATM machine. See where you could take out your money? 
and these are the little buttons, the, what the numbers would be. And just so you can see what the back of one would have looked like. This is just a poured resin, actually, and then you have the little film. The fans tend to think that it's all this expensive, microchipped, hand-produced, real working tricorders that cost us like $20,000 a piece. And generally, that's not the case. Uh, the dummies cost you know, $50, $100, $200 because they're just mass produced in these molded pieces. So you're actually one of the chosen few who's ever got to see inside of here. So we're gonna go back outside now so I can lock the door. What? Hold it, hold it, you know. The problem is, of course, that this is very top secret. And now you've seen it, I'm gonna have to lock you in and you're not gonna be able to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs>